Also, I'm going to go ahead and uh, welcome you guys in. Um, I, I think I recognize almost everyone. Uh, my name's Paula Work. I'm an assistant professor of drawing and painting here in the department. And um, I wanted to get a chance to talk to you about my exhibit. Um, it's, it's up just this semester. It's the culmination of an award that um, the school has, well, we have a, a very generous benefactor who also has donated a lot, you know, to our department and it provided this building and everything. So this award that I received was um, called the Endowed Teaching Chair Award. And it was, I had to uh, make a proposal and then, um, you know, was chosen, but there was a committee, so that was chosen with that. And then the award, it was, uh, it provided some uh, stipend and some money for supplies and, and whatever for a three year span. And then at the end of it, um, then I, I, I interpreted, I, I guess it could be different for everyone, but mine ended by having this exhibit of, of this work. So this is what I've been working on um, in some kind of form <laughs> for all that time. Um, the reason I, I say some kind of form is I, I made a proposal and I think with fine art, you know, you, there's, if I had to um, take the creation out of it and, and tell about that beforehand, I don't know that it would you know, I don't, I don't know that it would turn out really like that's all, that's kind of the whole thing about making art is that you, you have an idea, you start it, and it really kind of turns into a problem and then you keep working at it and wh where you end up is not necessarily where you thought you might end up, you know, so, um, but in my case, I think I have some kind of little funny, uh, funny things that happen. I, I, funny ha ha or not <laughs> but uh, I, my part of the proposal was I was going to um, do some travel some workshops and then a, a lot of it would go to supplies you know because I've never really had the ability to sink a lot of money into supplies like I'm an excellent scavenger you know I can find things to reuse and all that so that was a that was a great um, part of it. But the, um, after the first year, then of course we had our uh, pandemic lockdown. And I think shortly before that happened, I had gone around and kind of announced to a few people that I was going to plan on a trip to Scotland to hike and do landscapes because I had found these uh, photos online of these beautiful forests. And my reaction was, those are my trees, you know, so I just, um, that was a big plan, but of course all that stuff got kind of nixed and um, I found that my imagery changed a lot. I needed to adjust what I, what I was working on. Um, I was actually uh, working on that uh, painting with the horses over there, the, the large one, that, well that's the only one with horses over there. Um, I was working on that during spring break. It was completely different than that. And I don't know, I think that was a difficult time for all of us when we suddenly didn't know how we were going to proceed as instructors and studio instructors where you're really in person and doing a lot of things to share and, and show to everyone. So that one, um, you know, that really shook me up a good bit. And so I went, I, I pushed my way through that um, painting and worked on it for several weeks and I think, you know, I don't remember exactly when I got it to the point that I wanted it, but um, after that I kind of went through this little existentialist crisis Well, you know, where, oh, what's the point of doing this painting, you know, like who, who needs this, like I, I don't know, it just felt like there was a bigger, uh, big, a bigger problem than, than that, but um, that was good for me because I had to deal with something outside of myself instead of my own little uh, mental <laughs> crisis, I guess. So it was like, well, this is actually 
actually a thing. So, um, but anyway, it made me kind of have to dig really, really deep and see what I was about. And I realized also that my path that I had taken, um, this uh, school actually had so much to do with it because um, in my family, I think for those of you that are artists, you probably recognize in your family members that have gone before you that you can recognize who, who got the art gene or if that is a thing, you know? So um, I definitely would, I could see that, but we were not super valued, you know? And I say we as my sister and I, out of four siblings, uh, my older sister and I were ones that were always making something, you know, um, drawing and creating stuff. And so, you know, most of the family members that were before us, they were sort of, they were creatives that hadn't gone down that path. They, uh, you know, engineers or, or things like that, that you can be creative in those jobs, but it's sort of like, I think, you know, architecture, like there are very few artists that are, are architects that are designing great buildings. A lot of them are doing kind of uh, calculations for load bearing walls and electrical, you know, uh, diagrams and stuff like that. So they were um, definitely, you know, they had made the choice. They didn't go in the creative path and maybe that stuck with me and it just didn't even seem like an option to do that. But I, I, I don't remember ever even really considering doing that, you know. Um, I loved animals a lot. I think, you know, I love it, the form of animals definitely here in the show, that's obvious. But I was uh, really into science. I, I'm very much into nature, the systems and the order of nature. And that's from a long time ago, you know, I just always really had that about the animals. And then I love, you know, I was interested in science as well. So I was planning on going to veterinarian school and I worked at an animal clinic when I was in high school just to kind of, you know, that was what everybody said you should do to make sure that that's what you really wanted to do or not. And so um, I, I did that. It was very depressing and sad. There's a lot of cruelty and horrible things that happen. And, but I was thinking, oh, for the greater good, you know, I'll just continue on. And so uh, right after I finished high school, I was um, planning to um, start college. And then my mom was diagnosed with a, like a terminal cancer. It was really bad. And it, you know, they said five years, but no one really thought she would last that long. And so that, you know, that pretty much threw me for a huge loop as I think it would anybody. But I was all signed up for classes, but I, we ended up putting it off for a year so I could kind of take care of her and take her to treatments, chemo or radiation, all that stuff. And it just became really, really heavy and overwhelming for me. So, and I, I'm trying to make light of it, but it was, you know, I don't want to be like, I'm not whining and being a victim or anything, but it was just a really, really hard time. And one day before, I think it maybe as a week before classes were going to start. So I was all signed up like pre-med kind of, you know, track stuff that would lead me there. And I just said, I dropped everything and I said, I'm going to do art and just signed up for all art classes. It was just in, totally intuitive, you know, just going by the gut. That's what I had to do. And so I wasn't really looking forward or anything. I just kind of jumped into that. And so I came here, you know, to this art department and with really not, when I think of myself, my young self, I think I was so much in the moment all the time. I don't feel like I was looking forward too much, but so I didn't have huge expectations, but I just thought this is, this is what my gut's telling me to do. So I'm going to go, you know, here and do these classes. And this place was fabulous. You know, I, I think it still is, but um, you know, I, I had so much support and people noticed my work, the instructors that were here and they were encouraging. I'd never really had that, you know, I was really in the family where, um, you know, no one was too concerned what I was going to do later, you know. So uh, the second year 
or the end of the first year, I was awarded a full ride scholarship here. So that was very um, validating, you know, that made it like, oh, okay, maybe this is really where I need to be. And so I finished my second year and uh, my mother was still not doing well. And I remember talking to one of my instructors and I said, you know, I really want to go away to a, a really good school. I want to go somewhere because I could feel myself being sucked into the vortex of uh, family caregiving. You know, even after my mom was gone, I was just going to kind of end up taking her place and taking care of everyone, which I, I think, I hope that doesn't sound too selfish that I didn't want to do that. But I, you know, the art had kind of opened something in me and I realized it was a place of refuge for me, you know, that I had carried, carried inside and um, so it felt really right and I just had to do it. So anyway, one of my um, instructors that I talked to about that, she said, well, um, you know, those private schools, they have a lot of money um, for scholarships. I think you could get something, you know, if you apply. So I um, had another instructor um, Don Heber, which some of you will know, and he was, he was the one that I think I've talked to some of you guys before about we would start the semester, you know, it's a big full class, and then three weeks later you'd look around and be like, there's like eight of us left in here, you know, so he was pretty, uh, he was pretty tough, but his comment, you know, I said, I'm going to apply to all these, I'm going to apply to some school, and he said, well, you better pick a few because you won't get in everywhere. And I was like, okay, I, I'll do that. And so I applied to um, the Maryland, um, uh, no, I can't remember what Maryland School of, what do you know? What, Maryland School of Art and Design, or it's the one in Baltimore. I can't recall it right now, but, huh? Is it Micah? Maryland Institute of College? Maybe it is Micah, but it's in Baltimore. But anyway, it's a really good school. I, I was excited to go there. I applied there. I applied to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and I applied to the Kansas City um, Art Institute. And um, surprisingly, I got in everywhere. And so that was cool. I was like, okay, now I got a, a choice to make. I, I think I really want to go to Maryland, which is funny. I can't remember the name of the school, but so I really want to go there. And um, you know, got a healthy, healthy scholarship from there. And then my application to the Art Institute of Chicago was, I think we were sending them in back then. It was like they were gonna send them to the next school of some kind of group application. And this was pre-digital stuff, you know. So um, the, my application went to uh, the Art Institute of Chicago and they just went like boom and laid down this big scholarship. I didn't have to work. Um, I needed that, you know, because was, it was a troubling time. I was going to be relocating, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So um, that worked out. So I ended up going there, even though I kind of thought, oh, I don't know if I want to go there. But it, it is a really, it was a really good school. So I think it all kind of worked out. So, you know, I kept kind of tumbling along with these not real high expectations that something good will happen, but things kind of, as long as I stayed in art, it seemed like it, it was working out, you know. And so, um, same kind of thing, you know, just kind of getting different awards in grad school and um, stuff like that. Um, got a fellowship to, to a school I didn't really want to go to, but I, I went there, you know, it was just like a... Um, I just had to go where the money was because I didn't have any. I didn't have any support or anything. So, so I just think about, you know, starting here um, and, and coming back here. It's meant so much to me because, you know, I love being around, around you guys because you guys are all trying to do something, you know, and that's, to me, the best population to be involved in. You know, everyone's uh, working to it better themselves or they're on the path of something and and then to be back at this place that helped me so much you know I think I didn't have um, really anyone saying oh you should do this or you better you know apply to school and do this and that and um, so I, I think the accessibility of this place is really you know 
really one of its huge strengths, but it's also a very, very good school. Because when I left here and went to Chicago, um, I thought I would just be at the bottom of the pile and everyone there was like, oh, wow, you, you're really good. You know, like the education that I received here was really good. So, so then, you know, fast forward, I won't tell you how many years. <laughs> Um, I'm back here and then I got this award and so it meant kind of that same thing to me, you know, that, that validation and oh yeah, maybe I am kind of still um, doing the right, the right thing. So back to getting started on my, my work, um, you know, I went through that little bit like, well, why should I do anything, uh, you know, I could just crumple up in a heap and then, you know, eventually if you if you follow existentialism enough, you'll find that, yeah, there's no point you should do it anyway, so kind of thing. Um, so I just uh, put my head down and just dug in, and I, I wanted to be as authentic as I could. And so what that meant to me um, was to examine the creative process, the just you know, I think when you're younger or just starting out, and that carried me a long way, that when you're younger, it's just kind of learning how to do things. You know, there's such a thrill of that. And, and when something works, it's so exciting. You know, oh, wow, look at that. And I'm getting better, and you can see it. Well, eventually you get to a point where you can do everything, you know? And so, like, what's the new, what's the new wrinkle? So that kind of digging in and um, taking away anything that I didn't think had anything to do with my truth or what I was seeking. Um, because I do believe that art making is uh, problem solving. You know, it's really you have to first invent the problem and then decide, you know, why, why should you work on this problem and then what does that mean to work on this problem what's it you know what is what's the end result of that so um, that that really became my goal so my work here um, just that creative process that you know what I was talking about the inspiration is what most people know when they're young in school it's like oh yeah it's just, just great you know and all that I just remember those days of just making things and it was just so nice and then it, everything got a lot harder I think the more serious it became or the lack of um, just the newness of the materials or whatever it, it became a lot harder because it's almost like a uh, painful, you know, I think sometimes I was just working on these things and I couldn't get it where I wanted and and it, it just, you know, I often have this conversation with my painting students that I don't know what, what, if it's better to end, you know, working on a painting, you, you usually have a few sessions because it's several hours of work, so I didn't know if it was better to end on a, you know, dejected oh, this is crap, it's never going to get better kind of note, or to end, you know, on a high note, like, okay, yeah, I think I've got something, and then come back and be totally crushed. Like, kind of either way, it was, it's coming kind of thing, you know. So, um, but that was important because that, that was my guide. I didn't want to do anything that, you know, just was depending on, uh, my own voice when I'm teaching, you know, like, oh, here, you need to do this or you need to do that because I wasn't, I wasn't really going for any kind of academic um, realism at all. So, um, so that I, I've read since that there, that's, you know, when people study creativity, that's quite a common kind of progression. You know, you have the idea, it's sort of exciting, and then you get in there, and then it's, it's really hard for a while, and it, and so I question, like, why, you know, why even um, do this? And, but then once you get to that spot where something works out, it just, you realize the, it's less of a positive, it's more of like a removal of a heavy belief or burden or something that you had that was kind of in your way. And when it goes away, that it's, it's addictive. It's just addictive, I'll say it that way. Um, so... My pieces all went through that for sure. Some of them are 
more, you know, more hours into them than others, um, but all of them, I, I put the same kind of effort into them. And I, as I was working, you know, I, I mentioned that I, I, in the past, hadn't had um, a lot of money to invest in supplies. So this was a new thing, and I, I really love a square. So you can see I have all these canvases that are almost square. They're 48 by 50. Um, so they're almost square, just a little bit off of a square. And I thought, well, I'm just going to kind of put that parameter on myself and deal with it. There, there are a couple of little things, like the larger one that was earlier, and um, the hanging piece that was earlier, and some of the small things. But for the most part, those larger pieces, you know, I just kind of really went at them um, with that not like an end goal. I did walk off the feet in here and figure out like how many, you know, might fit and stuff like that. But so I got started and as I got to about the fifth piece, um, as I was going, I was always making a list of what I had done. I had a name for it, not necessarily the official title, but uh, I would always have a name. And so I'd make a number one was this one, number two was that one, you know, and so I was making this list. And when I got to about five of them, because I couldn't see them, I didn't have a big space to have everything just laid out. Um, once I got there, I started ranking the pieces. So I started saying, well, this one's better than that one, and this one's better than that one. And I, I kept going that way, and it, was, it, it became, I keep talking about it because it was sort of fascinating to me, and it's something I hadn't really done before. And so, as I got up, you know, there's like nine, ten, there's, I think there's like 12, 12 big paintings in here. Um, once I got all the way there, you know, when, as I'm going along, if something hit the bottom of the list in terms of I don't think that's very strong or, you know, I'm not, it wasn't really about what I, if I like it or not, it was how well it's working. And so if it got too, too far down on the bottom of the list, I'd bring it back in, into, back in the studio and just keep working on it till I could bring it up on the list. So that became really interesting because everything couldn't fit at the top, you know, but I, I think it, it, was, um, it, it was something I'll definitely do again. I, I enjoyed that kind of, um, oh, I thought I was okay but I've got to keep working on it sort of thing, you know. So, um, so that was kind of the, the process. The meaning behind my work, um, you know, I mentioned the animal forms. I, I do love animals, but most of these animals, it's not about a particular animal or even that species of animal. It's just the shape that that animal could make or the pose that the animal could make. Um, there's something about their, their ability or when I can capture what I'm looking for, their ability to be kind of carrying on in spite of uh, kind of the uh, stark darkness of reality. I mean, I, don't, I, I was trying to not make these paintings look I didn't want to hit anyone over the head like, oh, this is all about death and darkness and stuff like that. And so from the reactions I'm getting, I don't think that I hit people over the head with that. I think I was able to hide it. And I think that's part of my, um, I don't know, that's just my thing that I like. So I want a glimpse. I just want a glimpse of this animal form. And they're usually kind of performing or carrying on in spite of something, you know, and then once I have that, I'm just um, like adding to their environment things that I think will maybe balance the empathy, you know, give, show the empathy that I have for them. So the, you know, make, make everything kind of okay. So make it's my control thing, you know, so I can make stuff like, oh, well, it's, it's all right, and, and the animals know how to handle stuff, you know, so I don't have to feel bad about them. And, and so that, that's kind of how, how those, um, those all came about. And then um, 
uh, at the same time I was working on the assemblages. And so assemblages are the uh, little house forms, you know, that I have in here. I think there's seven of them. Um, I right from the beginning, I had planned to do them because in my past um, degrees, I had always done assemblages. Um, they really help to um, kind of hold the the idea for me until I, I got it figured out, you know, and it, almost like a sketch, but a little deeper than a sketch, you know. In the beginning, um, I made them of found objects, mostly, you know, found objects. And I was in undergraduate school when I uh, was introduced to Joseph Cornell, who's an artist known for assemblage, a uh, kind of surrealistic um, assemblage artist, or assemblage, as you'll hear it pronounced. Uh, he was from, I don't know, early 1900, uh, I think he died in 72. So just before I've, uh, well, quite a, a few years before I figured that out about him. But so I really fell in love with his work. And at the same time, when I was in Chicago, I found um, medieval reliquaries and icons. And so the, I, for those, you know, that I could feel the, that reverence, that worship, that, you know, that just really deep um, feeling toward whatever the subject was, you know, that's in there, like, you know, that, that was a religious thing, but I'm kind of like doing that for, for the, the environment that I want for these animals, like these animals can be okay in here and it's, it's a little bit, you know, a little bit of magic in there and a little bit of shaman, you know, bringing the spirit of the animals and, and that. So. Um, this time, the assemblages didn't work as easily as they had in the past for me. Um, in the past, I, I would make them. I always had this little stuff sitting around and just put them together and it was like boom. And then, you know, the paintings just kind of came right out of them. This, this time they didn't, um, you know, it was, it was just different, which just proves my my point really about art, like just when you think you have something figured out, um, that doesn't work anymore kind of thing, you know, so, and, and that's what I love about it. You have to sort of recreate it every time. But I did, I knew that I wanted, I knew what I wanted in them. I just had to make them work. So what they ended up being is more than, um, there are some found objects in them, but less of little trinket stuff, you know, more of like, uh, I don't know, branches or some things like that. Um, but what I wanted more was I wanted the box or the assemblage or little house, you know, to look like a found object, the whole thing. So if you found it someday, it would be like, what is this thing? You know, what, what is this for? Where, where did it come from? Instead of, oh, look at all the cool stuff in this box. I wanted the whole box to look like maybe the animal made that, you know, maybe that was just particular to that that place. So um, I, after I kind of figured that out, they were still quite difficult to make, um, but it did go a lot smoother because I'm frankly obsessed with silhouettes, so it gave me a chance to work with that. Uh, my camels, the running camels uh, piece over there has silhouetted um, camels. I have that going on with a deer. Um, the little circus, elephant, uh, tiger piece, those are silhouettes, but they're little, you know, they have some modeling on them and the fish. So um, that silhouette, that just that kind of a glimpse, a memory, you know, just a kind of an image from a, from a, a memory that you have, that's, that's really where I found those. I don't have them completely figured out, like what that means to me, but they, I'm extremely happy when I get my silhouette right. <laughs> like it just does it for me, you know, and I just want to put them everywhere. And that's really why on the camel one, you know, there's like three, three camels inside. And then I spray painted the camels on that cardboard and, and I love those camels too. So I hung them from underneath the, 
the box, so I just can't get enough of the, the silhouette. One of the things I love about it is that for the animals, you can't tell if they're going or coming, you know, like it kind of depends on how you're looking at it. So um, I love that about them. And then some of my time uh, spent in Japan and a lot of my life has a lot of, uh, you know, involvement with things Japanese. So um, I think that the little house, you know, the little, the little shrines that are just kind of here and there over there, that definitely influenced the house shape that I chose to do. And then the uh, fabric, I don't know uh, why or like when that really came to me, but uh, it was really, really early on, way before I had built the boxes that I knew I wanted to hang this cloth below them. And that is um, some fabric from Japan. It's like a kimono uh, wool. It's woven and kind of like a rice, rice pattern. So. Um, so they they both kind of work together simultaneously, and um, the paintings and the assemblages. I mean, but I kept them separate on lists. So the ranking of the assemblage was different than the ranking of the paintings. I, I don't I don't know exactly why. Like that's kind of part of the fun to me is that to figure things out later. Like why was I doing that? Oh, okay, I figured that out now. Because I did mention in my. Um, artist statement because it had only hit me just as I was writing that, that I was building assemblages when I was a little kid and putting that kind of magic into them because I would have, you know, there's some kind of animal I wanted, some pet or something, and I, I was not allowed to have it. So I would just make one and then make a little place to put them and little stuff that made me make it come true, you know, and little talisman and stuff like that. So. As I was writing my statement, I just thought, oh my gosh, I've been doing these my whole life and didn't really, uh, didn't really realize it. So um, I, think, I think that was everything that I was going to talk about, um, about the piece. And what I have really enjoyed so far in the talks is if people have any questions about any of, of the work, and then I could go into more detail with anything if you have something. Anybody got anything? Like why or something? Some of them I won't be able to answer, but yes? Um, what was the inspiration behind like, the land oil to the sky and the um, this, this one? Yeah. Um, that one came right after the horses with the persimmons underneath. So um, the arch idea is, the, is a medieval icon kind of thing. And I drew uh, some sketches of that sheep from a video. It was one of the All Creatures Great and Small, the series, the really old one, not the recent one. Some sheep um, killed in the field. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, I love the sheep floating and look so happy. I was like, well, I don't want to burst your bubble, but he's actually not very happy. But, um, but something about, you know, even, the, even though that's pretty tragic, it's kind of going to be okay, you know. The sky is a Maxfield Parrish um, illustrator, you know, kind of blue with the, um, I just always wanted to do something with that and it kind of fit together. And the, the uh, landscape at the bottom was just something I used to see really early in the morning when I was driving my son to, to work at some kind of, uh, horrible 3 a.m. sort of hour somewhere, but there'd be some lights kind of behind those pines. Those pines feel very uh, northwest Florida to me, so, so that's, that's where those came from. So nothing more than just, oh, this poor sheep, but everything's going to be okay. It's still like kind of great, so that's, that's what that one's about. Yeah. Anybody have anything else? Yes? Um, they're standing in a group, and I call that one prophets. And um, that one is kind of telling the rest of them something good, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I I saw um, Van Gogh did a painting of a, a fox bat. I can't remember now if it was just one fox bat or more than one, but I was like, fox bat. I gotta look that up because I love a fox, you know, and, and uh, 
vats are cool too and so they're really neat they're very large you know and they have that little orange kind of puff right behind their their neck so i definitely wanted to um, do something with them but just visually they the form was interesting to me but when it really like the empathy thing that I want all the time, when that really hit me was when I was looking at bats, I found a photo of those bats, um, a single one with a baby kind of hanging on and she was flying and she looked so worried. You know, I know that's like a kind of projecting a human emotion onto the animal, but I thought, well, you're just being silly like that bat's not really worried. They're just flying with their baby. And then I thought about it. It's like, no, it's daylight. They, they wouldn't be flying like that unless something bad happened to, you know, the place she's got to move her baby somewhere, you know? So um, that's when they, they became little figures to me that needed something, you know, needed a little, I don't know, my little magic stuff where I take care of them. <laughs> But I, I never thought about hanging them upside down. I've had some questions like, why are they standing up? It never occurred to me to hang them upside down. It just never did. So, but I love the blue line that they're standing on. So a lot of my paintings just have, I mean, not just, but beyond the imagery thing, I'm always like the color interaction and the compositional stuff. Like that's always a player in the, in paint. Um, so. There were always nice little things that could happen in there, even when I wasn't quite happy with uh, what, how the image was working out. But I didn't rework those bats a lot. That one was just like, that's it. Love it. It's done. <laughs> so, any, anyone else? Um, oh. This painting is the only one where the, the animal becomes maybe pushed in the background less important, not dominant, the candelabra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, I can try. <laughs> the um, candelabra was actually a, a student brought a bunch of stuff, like a box full of a bunch of stuff they were getting rid of, and this really beat up, uh, actually silver plate, you know, uh, candelabra was in there, and I said, ooh, can I have that? Because they brought it for the, my still life setup that many of you will know about in the drawing room and so um, I just you know when the minute I saw it I knew I had to paint it and so I started with that I knew that I would do something with the animals but it was mostly about the candela candelabra so it is different in that regard um, I wanted the the birds that are in there they are three uh, they're very subtle um, I, I don't know exactly what I'm doing there other than I'm <laughs> like hiding, hiding the animals. That one I was not happy with um, for a long time. It, was, it would fall to the bottom of the list. I would bring it back and work on it some more and it didn't really get off of there until I built my little box at the bottom that has some deer some deer horns in there and the eggs, that to me just like made a kind of perfect um, sense. But I, I don't know that I could explain it any further than, than that. That's a good question though. Did you have something, Morgan? The tiger yeah. Yeah, there, there are um, a couple of, well, there are three other tigers in there, this one, just a little one, and there's that one, and then there's that one right over there. I thought that was so thoughtful, but I didn't even notice it after I looked, until I looked at it for a very long time. Yeah, that was kind of the last thing I did to that, because I, I struggled on this tiger one a lot and still feel a little conflicted about it, and I, I think I figured it out today. I mean, I love it a lot. Like, it'll make it to the top. I also keep a list of love, most love, so it's, that's separate from working the best, but um, it's often on the top of my love list. Like, I, I don't want to um, let go of it or anything, but I, um, I, I changed it a lot 
but the last thing I did was those little silhouetted tigers in there, and then I was kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm happy with it now. But I think I figured out today the thing that's so different about it. Well, there are a couple of things, but it's very um, confrontational, and this one is less about the shape of that animal and more about the pattern. There's a lot of pattern in there, which I don't have going on um, elsewhere too much, so uh, maybe I'll figure it out <laughs> someday. So. Yeah. Did someone else, somebody else had a question back there? Yes. Uh, so I noticed if um, the mutations would cross like this, it means it's just crossing that. Is there a significance? Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty much pulling from, um, you know, Christianity's cross, you know, the medieval icon stuff, but sort of also at the same time using it as a compositional device, you know, because it, I was so happy when I found that cross the first time. I think it was the bats, though they were the first ones that I, I used it in. And I just really love the way it, it divided the space up. Um, and I like kind of sneaking it in there that it's not necessarily a cross for everyone. I know what it is, but um, you know, it's a little more obvious in the sheep painting that's way over there because of proportions of it, um, but yeah, it's just another one of those reverence, um, devotional kind of things, I guess. Yeah. Yes? The target? Yeah, the target, in a way, um, also became a I guess it's a little less of a compositional device and more of a spatial thing because when I put this, um, you know, this one is all about, we're kind of looking up into this arch and this fish maybe is hanging, maybe is swimming by here, but the, I like hanging things a lot, you know, like the gravity and that weight sort of thing, but this, Target allows me to open up that space to a certain depth without any more. You know, I don't have to say, oh, there's a room, there's a wall back there, there's, a, there's the end of the world, it's nothing. It's just, oh, there's where that space opens up to. So, um, and I didn't even realize when we were hanging these, Jason, that I put these next to each, each other, but um, this one, this actually, this fish painting is. Um, called over the target. This was kind of one of my breakthrough pieces. That was the one where I was like, okay, that's exactly what I needed it to do. Um, this one came before that, but I, I have worked this one um, a lot to death to get it. It wasn't, it just wasn't what I wanted for so many times, but um, the target was the last thing I went in there with, and it wasn't I didn't feel like, oh yeah, I'm gonna use that target again, like that worked pretty good. It was just, I needed something right there that kind of centers, you know, opens the space again, and, but not too much. So it's kind of a spatial device. And they just look really cool, you know? So when you paint in those lines, you get to do all kinds of different paint stuff, you know, on each, each color change there. So I like it because of that. Anybody else got anything? Question? Whoops. Uh-oh. <laughs> no? Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I hope everyone will write a comment if you have something insightful, because that might help my poor soul. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it.